I bring this uh, organizational meeting the Arlington School Committee to order. Um, first order of business would be the nomination and election to the office of chair, Mr. Thielman. I nominate Paul Schlickman. I second that. Any other nominations? Hearing none, nominations are closed. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, it's a unanimous vote with uh, Ms. Allison Ampey absent. Um, I nominate Jennifer Seuss. For vice chair. For vice Nominations chair. for vice chair. Uh, Second. Uh, Jennifer has been nominated and seconded. Uh, any other nominations? Hearing none, nominations are closed. Uh, all in favor of electing Jennifer Seuss, vice chair of the Arlington School Committee, say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. Um, next uh, nomination and election for the office of secretary. I nominate Allison Ampey. She's out of the room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I nominate Jeff Thielman for secretary. I second. Uh, any other nominations? Hearing none, nominations are closed. All in favor of electing Jeff Thielman as secretary of the committee, say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, it's a unanimous vote. Uh, next is the vote to approve committee and liaison assignments for 2015-16, um, noting that in the previously distributed version for the warrant committee, Dr. Allison Ampey is removed from that uh, duty. Uh, on, uh, and do I hear a motion to Wait, approve? So there was a change to the one that we last saw. Yeah, I, I don't know if the new one came out after. If you're looking at a new version or not, but the uh, previous one was sent out. As Dr. Allison Ampey's name removed. Just for clarification, by this vote, we're approving that committee. Yes. Okay. Just that committee. Yeah, but we're approving the whole the whole matrix. Plan. Well, but I mean, yes. since this was a new committee, I yes. didn't know if we were going to have a yeah, discussion. Yeah, we were. We're, we're, we'll uh, approve it with this. If we want to have a discussion, my intent is to try this out. I understand. So uh, if if it works, uh, wonderful. If it doesn't, we yeah. don't do it. Okay. Um, I move approval, and then they can have a discussion about it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I move approval of the uh, proposed committee assignments for 2015-16. Second. Okay. Uh, motion by Mr. Thielman, second by Mr. Pierce. Uh, Cindy Starks. Uh, so there will only be two people on the warrant committee? For now, yes. Okay. We, get, we will right. have the opportunity to appoint a third person if somebody would like to volunteer at some point. Okie dokie. Uh, but I, I'm hoping that we would just be able to go and take a look at certain things uh, with a little more depth. Uh, shouldn't be a big time commitment. Um, any further discussion on the proposed assignments? Uh, Dr. Seuss? Uh, yeah, so um, I love the idea of the Warren Committee. I'm not clear yet about the work involved, so I mm -hmm. just sort of have a better understanding of when <coughs> before the meeting the warrant is available that to thoroughly look at. Essentially, it's my hope that, I mean, we do spend some time within the, uh, the course of the meeting going through individual line items in the, uh, uh, in the monthly financial reports, and I think that there is an appetite to look at them, and I think we could do it a little more efficiently and a little more carefully uh, by having a couple of members meet with uh, Ms. Johnson mm -hmm. before the meeting and reporting out with her. Okay. So that, that's, that's sort of the experiment. The other thing is, is that uh, you guys are close to town and, uh, during the day and can come in and sign the warrant if we have an issue, particularly in the summertime. Mr. Hayner. Not on this, but uh, you had an uh, assignment for EDCO board. Mm -hmm. is, uh, is that the round table for school committee members? Because there's no, is, there's no school committee board. It's the, superint it's the superintendent uh, represents us on the board. Am I correct? In September, you take that vote as to who's right. going to be the primary representative. And my, I just, my, my understanding, when I served on it two years ago, it was go to the school committee roundtables and report back current issues going on mm -hmm. and then go like that, at that. So if that's the intent of that assignment, mm -hmm. I'm fine with it. If it's something else, I'm still fine with it. I just mm -hmm. want to get clarification where I'm going. Well, well, Mr. Hayner, you were chair last year, and you appointed somebody to that, so I would assume that the talk duties will be uh, Thank you. Uh, parallel. Um, any other discussion? I just say that um, I'm, I'll accept the nomination to serve on the negotiations subcommittees, but there are, there's a schedule of meetings already, and there may be some conflicts on my part. So I'm judging maybe going to some of these meetings alone. Fine. Uh, we, we, we all do what we can. Uh, Ms. Starks. I do believe that the current AEA and AAA negotiating team mm -hmm. will continue oh, mm -hmm. as is until these negotiations are concluded. Oh, okay. Great. And that you will basically take over 
for the next set. July 1. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I, didn't, I, I believe that you guys are off the hook unless you're already on the committee. No. So. Is that true? Is that my okay. understanding? That's Otherwise, fine. I have just a really free calendar for the next two weeks, and you do <laughs> It's my understanding that we do want to conclude with the but present I, I group. Is, okay. I, I assumed that that was going to, that's how that would I'm happen. I'm glad I, glad I raised Good this point. So, oh, okay. So it's clear that mm -hmm. Cindy and Judd are going to continue until July, <laughs> until the negotiations and are Kiersey. over. And Kiersey. Kiersey's on yes. AAA. Yes, with Kiersey. May, <clears> and Judd will continue. Then I join in May. July. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay. One more question. About, One more question. The, about the Warrant Committee? Yeah. Um, so just, um, I just wanted to ask Dr. Alice Sampi, did you not want to be on it for philosophical reasons or just you, efforts directed elsewhere? I, it's new. I personally think that there is benefit to having the warrant discussed on camera. Um, and I don't like tucking things away into subcommittees off camera. It, and I don't. I haven't seen it as a tremendous <coughs> time sink for everyone involved, and also it just seemed like <coughs> it, I'm already on budget and policy, and adding in something else that's meeting um, on a regular basis, I would rather not Got go it. there. Okay, okay uh, we're ready for a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, unanimous vote. Um, next is the Vote of, to authorization to sign the payroll warrant. I'd like to have a motion. So moved. To, what, well, let me say the motion <laughs> first. Move to direct the chair. To no, I, I'd like to move to direct the chair of the warrant committee, Mr. Hainer, to sign the uh, payroll warrant. I'm willing to do it. Mm -hmm. Continue doing. So moved. Uh, moved by Mr. Pierce, second by Dr. Seuss. All in favor say aye. aye. Oh, question? Discuss? Yeah. Yes. Um, can we, there's no legal. Any member can do that. Can be, we can a any member can else. be designated okay. by the committee because of the timeliness of the need to uh, pay our professional staff. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, all in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Unanimous vote. Uh, last is uh, BDA. E, uh, our school committee norms and standards. And it's become our tradition now to read the policy and to sign the policy. And there, I have a copy here and we'll pass it down. So I'm going to read it aloud so everybody understands what the policy is and our commitment to each other for the next year. We, the Arlington School Committee, acknowledge that a school committee meeting is a meeting of the school committee members that is held in public and not a public meeting and that we will make every effort to ensure that meetings are effective and efficient. To that end, we acknowledge the importance of subcommittees, and we and the superintendent agree to utilize them to focus on specific topics in depth and to prepare for presentations, deliberation, and possible action by the school committee. We, the Arlington School Committee, set forth these standards and norms that we will all commit to abide by as individuals as a committee. One, represent the needs and interests of all students in the district. Two, exercise leadership and vision, planning, policy making, evaluation, and advocacy on behalf of the students in district, not in managing the day-to-day -day operations of the district. Three, conduct our business through a set agenda. Emerging items will be addressed in subsequent meetings through agenda items. Four, provide full disclosure. Each member will provide input, encouragement, express concerns and positions rather than withhold information from other members. When a committee member feels that there has not been full disclosure, an objective process for revisiting the issue will be used. Five, maintain an open environment where each member is empowered to freely express opinions, concerns, and ideas. Committee members will work together to clarify and restate discussions in order to strive for full understanding. Six, keep an open mind and accept that they can change their opinions by recognizing that they are not locked into their initial stated positions. Seven, make decisions on information and not on personalities. Committee members will act with the best information available at the time, considering data, the superintendent's recommendations, proposals, and suggestions. The committee members will strive to make the best decision at the time. Eight, debate the issues, not one another. The committee will engage in critical thinking, expecting all committee members to freely offer div differing points of view as part of the discussion prior to making a board decision. Nine, not take unilateral action. 
A committee member's authority is derived only through a majority decision of the committee acting as a whole during an open public meeting. Ten attend meetings well prepared to discuss issues on the agenda and will be prepared to make decisions striving for efficient decision making. Eleven strive to have no surprises for the committee or superintendent. All members will receive the same information on all topics in a timely manner. Twelve strive to reach decisions by consensus, discuss with respect, disagree without acrimony. When consensus is not possible, all members will publicly abide by the majority decision. Thirteen, understand and respect the chain of command as it concerns roles and responsibilities and direct others to do the same. Fourteen, review and revise our standards and norms as needed as part of the committee's uh, self-evaluation. That is the norms and standards as established by policy BDAE, and I'm going to invite everybody to uh, join me in signing them for the 2015-16 uh, school year. Um, with that, the, we have concluded our agenda. I have a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. moved by Mr. Second. Thielman, second by Mr. Hainer. We, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We are now adjourned. We will resume in a, about five minutes ago. Um, <coughs> We have the artwork here. This pen is running out. The artwork. Uh, or is this current? Um, or is it? We did this. Oh, we did, we did it last, last time. So we don't have artwork to do. Okay. Yes, it's the same. Uh, okay, same artwork. We don't have to do that. So um, we have to do this. Ready to go? I hereby declare the meeting of the Arlington School Committee Thursday, uh, April 9th, in order. Um, our first, uh, first, I'd like to uh, uh, have a moment of silence for Julia A. Morrison, who is a lifelong resident of Arlington. Um, she's a beloved wife of the late Thomas E. Morrison, loving mother of Maureen Amaral and the late husband Richard. Uh, Charlene Ronan and her husband Richard of Arlington and Gail Keene and her husband Robert of Wakefield. Uh, she was a longtime traffic supervisor at the Brackett School, uh, much beloved. Uh, her funeral was uh, earlier this week and a moment of silence for her. Okay. Um, do we have the a list of people who have signed up for public participation? There is a list to the right. Um, I would like to remind people that under public policy, uh, uh, under Arlington <coughs> School Department policy, public participation is uh, limited to 20 minutes overall, three minutes per speaker, um, and the committee generally does not uh, discuss items brought before us. If we feel the need, we will include them in an agenda item at a later meeting. Uh, Mr. Spiegel. Uh, when you come up, we'd like to ask you to um, uh, state your name and address for the record. First, uh, Lee patton from Stratton School. Yes. Uh, come forward, sit at the microphone. <coughs> Thank you. That's Lee Panettiere. I live at Six Pawnee Drive. Mm -hmm. And I'll be as quick as I can. I know I have, if you add the negative five to my three minutes, I only have negative two minutes, so I'll be as quick <laughs> as I can. Um, I'm the mother of a second grader at the Stratton Elementary School, mm -hmm. and uh, behind me are the parents, uh, I think 20 or so parents of second graders at the Stratton Elementary School. They'll be fourth graders during the rebuild of Stratton. And so we are here to urge you, the school committee, to uh, change what I believe is the proposed Stratton building plan so that the fourth graders that year will be placed in an elementary school instead of at the Audison Middle School. We've written a letter to you explaining our reasons, which Dr. Bodie was good enough to bring in to you tonight. And um, 
in the three days it's been drafted, this letter has been signed by 70 parents, collectively representing 52 of the second graders, that's 73% of the class. Um, we want to start by saying that we don't mean to question the hard work that's been put in by the building committee. We have full confidence in the teachers and the administration of the middle school. And of course, we certainly fully support our principal, Michael Hanna, and the teachers at Stratton, who we know will do their best to make this a positive experience for our kids. But the middle school is not the place for fourth graders. We feel very strongly about that. What we propose instead is that you increase the number of modular classrooms at the Bishop Elementary School and uh, accommodate the fourth grade there. The members of our committee have reviewed the plans, and we believe this can work by adding two modular classrooms to Bishop and then using their computer lab space for a third classroom. Uh, there, may be other cla there may be other elementary schools in Arlington that would work for this too, we don't know. But what we do know is that we don't want to see them at the middle school. And here's why. Um, four main points I want to make. Number one, our kids deserve parity with other students who have been, have been moved for rebuilds. No other Arlington school has been asked to use modular classrooms. No other elementary school students have been asked to go to a middle school campus. But Stratton has several times been asked to house other elementary students. Um, point number two, the kids need, these kids need an opportunity for sufficient outdoor physical activity, including a play structure that's appropriate for kids their age. The middle school has no playground because middle school students don't go out for recess. We understand that they're going to take our kids out for recess if they can, but it's not going to be the kind of recess that they would get in an elementary school, um, where they would have a playground that's designed for fourth grade kids and the kind of play they do. I'm sure, I'm sure you parents know what I, what I mean. Active recess is vital to kids' education. Number three. The kids need access to facilities that are age appropriate, like a gym that's age appropriate, a library, the art, music, um, social worker, a nurse who specialize in their age group. And number four, the kids need the benefits of, an, of, of a school outside the modular classroom. If they're at the Odyssey in modulars, they're going to spend the vast majority of their time inside that modular classroom, um, including special classes, lunchtime, and whenever they have indoor recess. If the kids get to the gym at all, it's going to be very hard. The middle school students are going to get scheduling priority for um, for the gym, and there won't be enough time to rotate all the kids through the gym. So this means that the fourth and fifth grade students are not going to get the same time kind of physical exercise that they would get if they were in an elementary school. I'm sure I don't have to tell you what it would look like to have 25 fourth graders stuck in a modular classroom all day. Um, it would also be in the best interest of the Audison Middle School students to do this. Um, based on enrollment projections, the Audison will already have, without any Stratton, schools be, Stratton students being added, they're already going to have a 15% increase in their enrollment. You add the Stratton kids, and it's going to be a total 27% increase in enrollment at the Odyssey uh, that year. We recognize, I'm sure, you, I'm sure you know that we recognize that there's a financial component to this, to any proposal of this size. But we've looked at the records. We estimate that adding the two modulars at Bishop would represent around $40,000. And that's about 0.4% of the total rebuild budget of $10.3 million. Um, we think that's a small price to pay to make sure that the education of our, of our kids is adequate and that they get, they get the parity they deserve with other kids in the system. So I thank you so much for your time. If you have any questions, all of our, our phone numbers are on the letter we've given you. And we look forward to working with you on the project. Thank, thank you, you very much. Maya Ginnins. Good evening. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I really just wanted to make an announcement about an event that I'm planning or that we are planning with my shrinking group. Um, it's uh, a townwide Arlington cleanup event. Uh, as I'm sure we've all noticed, this winter has left the town uh, pretty dirty with litter um, and dirty snow. Um, and there's no townwide plan in place to pick up the litter. So this is the third year in a row that we've had a townwide event where people come to the Russell um, parking lot, they pick up a bag, gloves, they get an assignment, and um, 
go off and clean up parts of the town that they might have a particular interest in. It's been very successful. We've had over 100 people each year, um, but it's only been through coming to meetings like this, making announcements, um, contacting friends, going to the schools. So I just wanted to bring it to this group um, as leaders in the community. It's also a wonderful opportunity for high school kids to do some volunteer work. We have had a few high school kids in the past come and participate. Um, so I'm excited about the event. It's May 9th, 9 a.m. to 12, come any time. And uh, I will have snacks and coffee there. So I hope that maybe some of you can join us or at least pass the word along. And I'm gonna leave some uh, flyers up at the table. And for the benefit of people who are watching this at home, where would they meet up with you? Yes, so it, um, you meet at the, it's the municipal parking lot where the farmer's market is. Mm -hmm. Um, at 9 o'clock in the morning, we will give you everything you need, um, and then you just return your bag of garbage to the same lot. We will have a dumpster there waiting for you. And we have uh, collected an amazing amount of garbage the past couple of years. So um, the more people we can get out, the better. And it's really a great opportunity for kids as well, um, who's, you know, for a volunteer activity for, for little kids too. So Judd has participated two years in a row. Yeah, <laughs> and you, yes, so so thank you so much. I appreciate your time and have a wonderful evening. So that was, that's Saturday, May 9th? Saturday, May 9th. Saturday, May 9th. Saturday, May 9th, 9 o'clock in the morning. That's at the, the, just, that also coincides with the uh, DPW and the recycling group is having a big uh, bring anything and everything to the DPW lot, same time, so. Well, it's, it's a common theme. Yeah, yeah common yeah, theme. Yeah, yeah. Clean up the town. Well, we'll have a beautiful, clean town with flowers and no snowbanks. Thank uh, you so much. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is a presentation of PDP Literacy Lab. Laura, do a quick introduction of that while sure. Linda sets up. Certainly. Yeah. Mr. Schlickman, could you yes. please explain why we have the wonderful banners? Oh, so okay. Uh, yeah, we'll do that. We, got, we started a little late tonight, so I uh, didn't uh, thank the committee for electing me chair. And uh, uh, the one thing that the chair is supposed to do is lead the committee to the decision it wants to make, uh, and that's <coughs> going to be my primary intent. Uh, I missed the last meeting, and uh, I was in Japan at the time. Uh, we visited our, uh, uh, Rieko and I visited our sister city in Nagaoka Kyo. We met the new mayor. We met the um, uh, principal of uh, Nishio Tokuni High School, who's very excited about uh, furthering our relationship together. And uh, we brought some banners home for everybody's kitchen. These are all food items. These things traditionally hang um, in, in front of restaurants, advertising some delicious things like uh, noodles. And I know that uh, Dr. Allison Ampey has a squid in front of her. So uh, uh, we, we brought these home for everyone, um, just for the uh, joy of having a souvenir from Japan. Thank you. Thank you. And um, uh, Ms. Hansen, are you ready? Excellent. Dr. Chesson. Dr. Chesson. Dr. Chesson is going to get a short Linda Hansen is one of our two literacy specialists. And about a year and a half ago, maybe uh, Linda and uh, Evelyn DeRosa, who is the other literacy specialist, um, participated in a training at Teachers College for Lucy Calkins. And they came back totally inspired from the model of professional development that they had seen um, in which the people actually uh, went into a school in New York City and worked with students in that school under the direction of the Lucy Calkins staff and they would get immediate feedback on uh, what they saw and um, they came back and said, you know, we have to do something that's like that. So we've had a program that started this year and uh, Linda's going to go over um, the details of that program, and then I'll just summarize, I think, where we're going to go from here at the end. Great. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm really excited to be here this evening to tell you about this, what we're calling, it's, a, it's really truly a teacher-led professional development opportunity, unlike any opportunity that I've been involved in before. And it's very, very exciting, and the teachers that have been involved so far have given us really great feedback. So um, we'll watch a short, I'll we'll go through a short PowerPoint and then I have a short video also to show you some of what's going on in the classroom actually. 
So as Dr. Chesson said, it started out uh, about a year and a half ago when Evelyn and I went to New York City. And within about two hours of arriving there, we were put in a classroom in Brooklyn. And we were given a short little introduction about what we were supposed to do. And we had to create a lesson and start teaching kids right then and there. And as we taught, another one of our colleagues observed us teach. And then after about 10 minutes, we pulled outside the classroom. We debriefed on what happened, kind of tweaked the lesson, made it better, changed roles, went back in, grabbed some more kids, and did it again. So just this idea of real-time practice of the art of teaching in front of real kids with you know, real-time feedback from your colleagues really struck us as a great way for teachers to do a lot more of the professional development that we need to do now with the Common Core, which is really not just changing the content, but also changing our instructional practices. So that's what this is really trying to get at. So it's, it's really utilizing our teacher leaders as instructional leaders in a peer coaching situation. So teachers with instructional ex expertise in a particular content area host weekly visits for their colleagues during an entire unit of study. So we've really focused on writing right now. So during one of the Lucy Calkins units of study, let's say information writing, the mentor teacher will host up to five teachers at a time to come into her class to observe her teach her students as she would teach any other part of the day. So her day is really not interrupted. She's just doing her thing. Um, so the target audience is teachers in their third year of teaching or more, and the reason being teachers in their first and second year are involved in a very in-depth teacher new teacher mentoring program, so they already have enough kind of on their plate. So this is meant for teachers in their third year or more of experience. Um, teachers who want a hands-on experience of observing an expert teacher guide students through a new unit of study or one that they don't feel as confident about as, as other things that they teach. And then also just teachers who want to collaborate with their colleagues around instructional practices in a particular unit of study. And the idea that we got from our visit to New York was that it's, it's interacting, it's not just observing. You're not just there with your notepad sitting at the back of the room taking notes. You're sitting tucked up right close to where the kids are, so you're listening to the mentor teacher, but when the kids turn and talk or get into small group experiences, you're right there interacting with the kids, listening to them, posing questions, and practicing your teaching moves right along with the, the experienced teachers. And then again, kind of the, the higher level goal that we're, we're partly there but not fully there yet is this idea of having teachers then setting up the experience. So for instance, with um, writing conferences, we would watch the mentor teacher conduct a couple writing conferences. We would go out in the hallway, debrief. Then we would have pre-selected a student's writing sample and go in and, and conduct a writing conference with one or two peers watching us pull out, debrief, go back in, pick another kid. So practicing. Um, so one of the great benefits that we've seen, too, is that as teachers are getting into each other's rooms during the school day, they're just really enjoying the experience of talking about instruction with other colleagues during the school day, so much so that at the end of one of the sessions, one of the participating teachers in a fifth grade session said to myself and the mentor teacher, I'd really love it if you guys would come to my classroom and see me teach a writing lesson because, you know, I just... Like, that would be fun. So that's what we did at the end of the lesson. So it's kind of fostering this environment where people are comfortable inviting each other into each other's classrooms to, to, to watch each other teach. So the format of the lab site is that a teacher leader, so teacher leaders meet with participating teachers at other schools three times, one after school, once before the six to eight week session starts, just to kind of set the whole thing up, once midway after school, and then once at the very end to debrief about the whole experience. Then they are released, um, the, the participating teachers are released um, for 90 minutes a week, uh, and the principal typically arranges coverage with a TA, with a student teacher. Um, somehow the principal works out coverage. Teachers have 15 minutes of travel time, 40 minute lesson observation, five minute debrief, 15 minutes to travel back to their home school, and then 15 minutes to write up 
their, their observations and noticing and questions for the mentor teacher on Google+. That's the format that we're using. And again, most of the coverage is managed through um, in-house resources in the school. So the teacher leaders are paid a stipend for the additional preparation time that they have um, for leading the three after-school sessions and for the time necessary to manage the administrative details of the program. And we are working with a budget this year, but we're still tweaking it. Um, the teacher observers are paid just our $25 an hour after school summer rate time for the three after school sessions. And otherwise, it's all in, you know, embedded during their school day. So we have had um, eight sessions successfully um, run so far at all five grade levels, two in each of the three um, grade one through three classes, one each at fourth and fifth grade. And we've had about 25 teachers participate to date in one of these experiences. And five teacher leaders, one in every grades one through five, um, who has been nominated and, and chose to serve as this district writing, writing mentor at their grade level. So these are um, at the end, like I said, so midway and at the end we have these debrief sessions with the teachers. And so I've just kind of collected here a few of the comments that teachers have made during these debrief times um, and they're paraphrased. I'll read a few of them just for the people at home. They might not be able to see the screen. So things that we're hearing often are things like before this experience I was very anxious about teaching this particular unit. I'm a person who learns visually. If I see someone doing it, it's more helpful. Watching Amy teach the lessons made them seem so doable and manageable. Um, and, and again, just people commenting on the experience of just getting into a classroom, watching their colleagues teach, and talking about teaching. Um, you hear about how isolating classroom teaching can be. Um, spending a day with 25 kids all day long is, is great, but getting to talk with other adults about teaching is, is really exciting too. Um, so teacher leaders, interestingly enough, are also finding this a very useful experience. They feel like the ability to reflect on their lessons, to really, they find themselves thinking through them two and three times um, because they know they're going to be a model for other teachers. And just reflecting and talking with other teachers about their lessons is something that they're finding um, very powerful as well. And then we also have interviewed some principals whose teachers have participated, and they're also very positive about this experience. And they hear how excited their teachers are coming back. Um, things like this framework of teachers observing other teachers and reflecting on those observations is shown to be the most effective professional development. So I was glad for the opportunity for Stratton faculty to participate. Based on the experience of a teacher who has completed a full cycle, I've seen that her openness to reflecting on her practice has deepened significantly. Additionally, her grade is leading the school in participating with the math coach to receive instructional coaching. I'm sure her availability for this comes from her experience in the lab site program. So those kind of comments are what we're hearing back from principals as well. So we wanted this experience to be kind of to put a bubble around it and let it be just for teachers working with other teachers initially. Let them have a chance to go in, observe each other, talk to each other, just have it be a very much a peer mentoring um, situation. But we definitely uh, um, had principals kind of knocking at the door saying, hey, you know, we'd like to tag along as well. So what we in implemented on the second round of sessions was that um, if a teacher from a school was going to attend a lab site session, the principal would be invited to tag along to one of the sessions so that they could watch this experience together and then be able to discuss what they saw um, after they had participated. So that's what we've started doing now. So I have a short video that I'm going to show you, just four minutes long, of a third grade writing mentor teacher at the Dallin. Her name is Amy Walter, a fabulous teacher. She, th she's in her seventh year of teaching. Um, the participating teachers that you're going to hear um, during the debrief at the end are Siobhan Foley, who's in her 16th year, Crystal Power um, in her fourth year, and Michelle Crowley in her fifth year. And one thing that people sometimes say about teachers um, stepping out and becoming mentor teachers is that more experienced senior teachers don't always want to learn from their less experienced colleagues. I just have to say we haven't found that at all. And in fact, in many cases, all of the participating teachers have more experience than the mentor teacher. 
It's, it can just be a factor of how you were trained, um, what conferences you've been to, what you feel like your particular skill set strength is. So that's also been a really nice thing of people just feeling like, hey, whoever I can learn from, that's, that's where I want to go. So the video that you're going to see um, is in two parts. Uh, the first part, you're just going to see some very quick glimpses of a third grade classroom at Dallin, just to see kind of get your head into the the writing experience, what it looks like, and um, you can take a look at what the teachers are doing, uh, what the mentor teacher is doing in this clip, what the participating observing teachers are doing, what the students are doing, and um, also just maybe notice how many different configurations the students find themselves in during this, remember it's a writing lesson, You're not, it's not maybe what you picture in your head when you think about a writing lesson. The second part of the video is a debrief with the teachers after they've completed one full cycle, just talking a little bit about what this experience has meant to them, kind of how they felt, why they signed up for this in the first place, and then what they feel like they've gotten out of it. Writing. Okay, so we write about nonfiction topics 
think that's probably one of the most powerful statements at the end where she talks about how she can raise the expectation for her class. Um, I actually watched Amy's class. I snuck in and watched Amy's class um, with these teachers. And when we went out in the hallway, all I kept thinking was, yes, they were learning about writing, but she is such an extraordinary teacher and her students were like amazing. And yet they, it wasn't like they were handpicked. I mean, she had high expectations. They responded to her expectations. The amount of work that they produced while we were there was, was just amazing, the seriousness of which they interacted with one another. And those teachers were learning those things as well. And I have to say that this is a key part for us um, of part of our program that's called um, SPY, Strategic Planning for Improving Instruction. Um, it, we see this, this kind of program and this teacher-led professional development as the future of where we're going. And I'm pleased to announce that Arlington Educational Foundation has given us a grant to expand the lab site program for next year. And from the district portion, we're gonna be establishing a committee of administrators and teachers to really look at what it would be to formalize the teacher leadership program within Arlington. And we have a big team that's going on April 30th um, to a, a, a one-day conference on um, activating teacher leadership. And we will never have enough resources within the district to provide the level of support that our teachers, and particularly at the elementary level, where the demands are so high with the Common Core and all the subjects they need to teach, um, and all the, the behavior techniques and, and skills that they need to work with with students. Uh, we will never have enough staff within the district at, you know, at the staff supporting level. We need to activate our teacher leaderships. And, and I, I can't say enough about what Linda and Evelyn did because I basically said, you thought it was that great? Have at it. And they did, and, and it's just been phenomenal. So, Question. yeah, I'm okay. happy. Questions, Mr. Hainer. The, uh, you just mentioned about the, the funding that we're going to get, is that for a one year? It's a one year. We've put in a one year grant um, and it would be considered, Mr. Hainer, for what they have expansion grants that they right. give, they usually give us on a three year basis. <coughs> so we, we have to get some more data before we would go back for that. Right, I, I, I guess I, I see the value in it and I, I assume each year that there's going to be evaluation of it. Uh, yes. I think it's going to be positive. I think this is something we ought to consider as a part of the budget uh, I, I am very insecure in de being overly dependent, especially on a program like this in the future, uh, on grants. Actually, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Hanson and I discussed that this afternoon about how we have a, think we have a way of including it in the budget. Well, I'm, I just want to make it. We're, we're, right, we're right in agreement with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Seuss. Oh, um, I, I think this is really exciting, and I think Arlington uh, parents should be um, very excited about the introduction of this. Um, I, I know what it is to feel isolated in a classroom and um, to need that sort of, you know, one-on-one -on -one communication with the, or one and three or whatever uh, with your fellow um, <coughs> educators, um, and I think this is really effective. I do have a question about finance um, stuff. Um, so if, and I know this is not settled yet, but if we move to the model of a shorter day on Tuesday, um, we're basically doubling the amount of time that teachers have to get together with each one another. And I'm wondering if that would be a sufficient time to accommodate this kind of, get, so that they wouldn't need necessarily to have the extra three hours that could be accommodated within the, the time that they have. It's not uh, something we thought about. But. We haven't thought about it, but we, mm -hmm. In the proposed elementary schedule, um, I don't, it, in the current model, I would say that no, it would probably not fit in very well just because unless it was part of a PLC for a group of people that cross schools, that might be a possibility. But most of the PLC work, which is really common planning time with your uh, colleagues at your grade level will occur within the building. Um, I think that, uh, we have already have sort of the same, well, a very similar model for our pre-professional teachers mm -hmm. for math and for reading. And we've been able to include a lot of the stipends that go along with that in our Title IIA. Mm -hmm. You know, whether that will be a, a possible source will be something that we'll have to look at in the, because we also have, it depends on how many teachers we have at each grade level and we go into next year. So that's another resource possibly for this. And then actually I have another question about funding. Um, so I know that we've eliminated the um, building-wide subs 
because we because potentially in the budget. Um, do we have sufficient coverage to relieve what? the I'm three positions that we have? Oh, oh yes. Um, so, so that we have less coverage than previous mm -hmm. than last year. Mm -hmm. I think that this that served the purpose this year mm -hmm. to allow the opportunity to do the kind of data review that we wanted to have happen at schools. Mm -hmm. But as we move into, the, hopefully move into this new elementary model, that is built in time in the early release time of the data. So no, we are not. In fact, that's actually having that money available is also one of the parts that's able to sort of fund okay. as we, some of the programs going forward. Mr. Thielman. Uh, great presentation. This is very helpful and informative, and a lot of good work is taking place. I was struck by a comment by one of the teachers. It might have been uh, Ms. Foley saying that, uh, or one of the teachers said, you know, this is the first time I've, I've observed you teach. And I'm wondering, um, you know, it's all, I, I'm, I'm really only familiar with the schedule at a high school. So what, what <clears throat> are we making an effort in the elementary schools, I guess it's a question for all of you, mm -hmm. to allow teachers to observe their colleagues teach on a, on a on a regular basis. Is that something we're able to do? Are we doing that? So I do want to pick up on that comment just because the teacher that made that comment is the next door neighbor to the mentor teacher there. Mm -hmm. So the fact that she says, you know, I've always really wanted to get into your classroom and I've never had the chance to see you teach before, I, I, you know, just it, it underlines what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And I think as teachers are coming out of this experience, they're saying, not only do I want to repeat it again in maybe a different content area, but I also want to see fourth grade now. These are third grade teachers. I want to see second grade. I want to see what comes before and what goes after. And I do know that principals have made time for teachers to do that this year with the rotating subs that have been going around. But I, I think what I see is principals seeing how excited teachers are at about this experience and also knowing professionally what great experience it is, that they're finding ways to allow teachers to get the coverage they need to start to get into each other's classrooms. And maybe give each other feedback too, I hope, I would hope. Uh, it just happens naturally yeah. as a matter of course. Yeah. And the feedback usually goes both ways. Yeah, right. Yeah. It is an integral part of the teacher evaluation system at yeah. this point, mm -hmm. um, that when people uh, feel like there's an, in their professional development growth, uh, goals, if they feel like they need to see someone, principals are making the time mm -hmm. for them to go in and see a colleague, sometimes in their same school, sometimes in a different school. We've even had principals that will go with that teacher so that they can have a joint conversation about what they see. Mm -hmm. So it, we're really trying to get it, that into the fabric of our teacher evaluation system. Yeah, so I mean, I, I'm, I'm great. we're getting a little bit off topic of what Linda's presentation was about, but I'm, I'm just wondering if there's a way to institutionalize that so it sort of becomes, or systematize it so it happens on a more frequent basis. Well, one thing I think I would say also is that um, Dr. Bodie and you all with your, in your budget process have given principals a little bit more support um, mostly for the new evaluation system, I think, was, was how it was construed in the terms of TA support um, at their building to kind of use as they see fit. And this is one of the things that principals are doing with that additional support. And it does support the evaluation system, but it also supports professional development. So there is some of that built-in ability right now. Thank you. But I think it's, it's helping get an appetite for it though too and, and get teachers interested in actually saying I want to do that and other teachers being comfortable saying yeah sure come in and visit you know. I mean, that's usually the best PD is peer to peer. It's, it's, teachers it are definitely. saying it's so much more powerful than you know all of the sit and get presentations which we don't do any of those here I just want to say but <laughs> you know it's so different hearing about something than seeing it in action in a classroom right next door or right across mm -hmm. the district. Teachers read these professional manuals, these curriculum books, and they're like, I've never, I've never met this kid who says this and does this. <laughs> There's a lot of suspicion about, you know, kind of like where these fictional kids actually come from. Arlington. And mm -hmm. well, now they can't, there's no argument, you know, like I, I loved the woman, Michelle's um, comment about, I know you didn't get all the best writers of the third grade writers that yeah, Dallas yeah, has. Mm -hmm. So she, I- There were some in hiding in her- I house. have to conclude that it's, you know, it's your high expectations, it's the way you run this program that you're getting these results. So I'm, I'm feeling like I can up my game too. 
Oh, another thing that's happening that I don't think is clear from the video is that we're actually videotaping these lessons and we're putting them on the district oh. website so that other teachers can see them. And in the debrief, one teacher said, I go back and I watch the lesson that you did before I have to do it so I can remind myself of what that's, I did. So. That's very effective. So we're trying to build a video library over time where we have, so now we have six or six, le, le, six or seven lessons from each unit of study and they're in, they're in the closed you know, Google Drive of the Arlington Public Schools network, so that's where they live. Um, and we are working, um, getting permission, um, video sign-offs for the parents. I just want you to know that we're mm -hmm. taking care of that too. But right now it's used exclusively for teacher professional development purposes within our closed system. But teachers have found it to be a great resource. And also teachers who can't get away or can't join that session have a way to kind of get a look at what's going on with those lessons nice. as well. Okay. Good. Any other comments or questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is the Arlington Nursing Department update. Yes. Yes. Dr. Bodie. Yes. Um, let me invite um, Sue Franke, who is our Director of <coughs> Nursing for the District, and to join us. Thank you for being here. Oh, you're welcome. She's left a room full of us in front of Sue. <laughs> <laughs> Sue, Sue has many hats. <laughs> so this is a little new to me. Um, I'm assuming I click to the right to move forward. It's awesome. Actually, it's, I, I should say it's Dr. It's Dr. Franke. She um, completed her doctoral studies a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> so it's funny. I, I did have a class with 120 students, and, uh, and I'm not nervous in front of them, but I am here, and I don't know. That makes <laughs> no sense at We're all. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I'm used to that. I'm not used to this. So this is basically just to meet you and get, so that you know who I am, I know who some of you are already. Um, and to let you know what's going on in our department, I'm not gonna go through the minutia of everything nurses do. It's not the same that we used to do, it's much more um, detailed work these days. Uh, and some of the concerns I have with our growing population and with our growing medical acuity of students with serious, serious healthcare needs that we did not see two years ago and before. So. Um, I just thought this would be a good opportunity for me to um, let you know what's going on. And when I sent this, uh, whoops, oh, I hit the wrong one. Oops, there we go. When I sent this out, I, you probably have my notes <laughs> on it too. I apologize in advance for that. But um, this is a breakdown of our numbers for our nursing coverage. We have one full-time nurse in every school, and then um, we have a couple of one-to-one -one nurses for students that have serious medical issues. Um, one of those nurses is funded through the town, and one of those nurses is funded through, um, we hire an agency because the student is not in school very many hours a week, um, anywhere from six to eight hours a week on average. So it um, behooves us to use an agency nurse for, for that particular child. Um, I have two grants from the Department of Public Health. Uh, the larger grant, the ESHS grant, um, covers two full-time, or almost full-time, per diem nurses. I say with variability because sometimes we, we have one nurse that's um, a permanent per diem nurse five days a week and one, he, he is with us about three to four days a week on average. So these are averages. And then we have a new, I'll get into it a little bit, um, we have a new ICC grant that's um, Innovative Care Coordinator grant from D, DPH we just got last spring. And that funds a care coordinator, almost like a case manager, to help oversee um, and manage the care of some of these students with um, complex medical needs. And when I say medical needs, I also am referring to um, kids with school adjustment issues, <coughs> kids with mental health issues. We're going to talk about that. Actually, that's, that's the um, focus of a lot of my talk this evening. Um, and we're just seeing enormous rises in children with anxiety <coughs> in our schools. And it, we need to address it with some, with some help. So I wanted to show you these ratios. Um, the Mass Department of Public Health uh, has guidelines. These are not mandated guidelines, they're just simply guidelines, that there should be one nurse to every 450 students. And this is not reflective of the acuity of somebody's health issues. Um, National Association of School Nurses, uh, their estimate is one out of every seven, one nurse to every 750 students. Bear in mind that that demographic is across the country. We have communities um, 
in uh, r more rural states that have schools that are 20 miles away from each other, and one nurse might travel from one school to another uh, in one day. So that number is, it's, it's not a realistic number. We could never look at those numbers in our town. And in terms of what the town funds for our nurses, in the high school we have one nurse, too. I, I just got these stats the other day from Karen Tassoni. Um, one nurse to 1,277 students, and at the Audison, one nurse to 1,105. And then I used the um, ESHS grant to fund the per diem nurses for extra coverage. So that's how we get the extra nurses in those schools as a general rule. And that doesn't include me, because I've been in the Audison for the last three days covering because we've been, um, had a lot of nurses out sick. There's a stomach bug going around, just for the record. <laughs> they're thinking about contaminating the peers because there's so many kids that are out sick right now throwing up. Um, probably a gastroenteritis going around, but those numbers do not reflect my position or the care coordinator position. And I wanted you to be aware of the rising number of office visits. I don't need to tell you that these numbers are going up for the students coming into the school system. You know that better than I do. But, in, but we have a very um, specific, a very excellent electronic medical record system mm -hmm. um, that we can capture data. You know, it, w one has to remember too, garbage in, garbage out. We've been working in the last two years to really make sure the nurses are um, being very specific about their student encounters. So when a student comes in, we try to capture what time they came in, what time they leave, and, um, and why they're there. And that's broken down into uh, many different categories. But overall, these are our numbers of student encounters in the district over the last three years. And as you can see, in 2013, 26,700-ish. Uh, in 2015, it's gone up quite a bit, over 10,000 in two years for encounters. But our nursing staff has not necessarily reflected um, being able to take care of that. Um, this is just the same information on a graph. And just I thought you sh might want to know information about concussions. Um, these are our documented cases of concussions um, just for this year uh, is 47. Now one can argue that kids are getting diagnosed with concussions more. We have um, far more rigorous screening tools. We don't diagnose them here. They get diagnosed at, um, by a physician or a nurse practitioner but or a PA. Um, but, but these numbers are rising, and these are students that require a lot of care because they come into the office every day with symptoms related to their concussion and how we're going to manage that. And actually, we can take these numbers and break them down even further to tell you how much time they're spending in our offices. And these are reportable medical conditions to the state. Um, we have uh, approximately 185 kids with asthma uh, or asthma-like illnesses, such as reactive airway disease. Life-threatening allergies, 213 in our district. Mm -hmm. I didn't know one when I was growing up. I didn't know anybody with a peanut allergy <coughs> or a tree nut allergy. But these numbers are just continually growing. And we actually have uh, nine students with diabetes in the town. <coughs> Interestingly, um, a large cohort of these students are in the Thompson district. Mm -hmm. I would love an epidemiological study on mm -hmm. that, quite honestly. So th these are projections for resource util utilization. We know the population is increasing. We know that health acuity is increasing. Um, like I said, we have students coming into our offices that we never would have seen 25 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, because sadly these students might not have survived some of the medical conditions or syndromes that they have. Um, and we have to take care of them, and we have to keep them safe. And that's my biggest fear in the future, is how are we going to keep these kids safe? Um, you know, I think about it being like a firefighter in, in some ways nurses are like firefighters, we, we have to constantly put out emergencies. Um, if there were one little campfire, I could probably say that any of our nurses could handle that. But with the growing population, one could use an analogy of more and more campfires having to put out until we get a forest fire. And I would hate to see that happen. Um, we are a community that is surrounded by some amazing hospitals. And so a lot of kids move into the district because they have uh, the health care around this area as mm -hmm. well. And as I'm going to touch on, I wanted to touch on the Audison. That's where I wanted to move to. Um, the number of kids coming in with mental health-related um, issues, such as anxiety, is just 
jumping off the charts. I've never seen anything like this. I don't know why. Um, there's many theories out there. I don't think anyone can pinpoint it to anything. And what makes it more complicated is nurses get sick too. They're in the trenches working with the kids that are sick and, and they, get, they get sick as well or they have children that are at sick. So we don't always have great coverage in our offices. And I just wanted to touch just briefly on the um, Innovative Care Coordinator Grant. Um, I've joined the Department of Public Health Task Force um, to help sort of procure this. Um, we get about a little over $35,000 a year towards having a care coordinator oversee the issues, whether they're concussion related, whether they're um, anxiety related, school adjustment issues. That person is the gatekeeper and the go-to person for when a child has these um, problems and they're trying to make it through the school day. So the, the care coordinator um, is the one that communicates with everybody in the schools, with the parents, and sort of oversees the general care of the students. Um, we just got an AEF grant that, uh, this week, so I was very excited, um, to also allow uh, half a day a week for the care coordinator, and I think we can stretch it to a day a week, um, to go into the elementary schools, it's one year, um, in order to create sustainability with care coordination in the in elementary <coughs> schools, we want her or him, because um, we're reposting for the position, um, to teach the elementary school nurses how to be instrumental in coordinating the care of a child that has medical or mental health related issues. So we're very excited about that. And also, um, we're able to track a lot of these um, student encounters for children with anxiety issues. So I, I picked on Audison because I couldn't believe the numbers and the way they were rising. Um, when I say MH, it's related to stress, anxiety, or any behavioral related encounters that children might be experiencing. And um, these numbers are just dropping off the chart. Um, because, the, because we've been tracking this closely this year until April, um, and I don't have numbers for a full year, uh, in the previous years I also used the same um, number of days just to make sure that the data was um, equal. And these are our Audison encounters. So I remember um, being at the Audison and working there, and I would see on average about 20 students a day. Now we're seeing anywhere from 40 to 60 students a day. That was just two years ago. So we're seeing a 100 to 200% rise in encounters just within the last two years. I can't account for this. Um, I, I don't know what's going on, but it's um, concerning. and the. We've been using our per diem nurses to help cover there, but I'm sort of afraid of losing those that are really good. We really need some extra, um, we really need another nurse up at that school. Just, we really do. Um, I wanted to break down some mental health encounters even more at the Audison. Um, just this year, we've had 23 um, mental health related hospitalizations. That's probably double what we have here at the high school this year alone. Um, these are what we're seeing. And this is how we capture our data. We, use, uh, we can actually capture the amount of time the students are, are in the health office. And for one student who's only been there for 16 times, this is how long that particular student was in the health office. The other one, student B, has been there for 51 visits, and they've been there for almost 1,600 minutes. Um, as I said, I've been there the last three days covering, and I had one student who just came down for something quite benign, and I said, do you know that you've been here 60 times this year already? <laughs> and he said, I have? <laughs> and I said, yes, you have. <laughs> Let's get you back to class. Um, and 119 <coughs> students with greater than 10 office visits, and so far, uh, I captured this data just a few days ago. There's been over 3,000 visits with those 119 students alone. Um, I just also wanted to touch on Menominee Preschool. This has been something in the back of my mind um, for the last couple, of, uh, last year and this year, and then I just went down to the preschool to um, work with them in a meeting. And um, because of the services we offer here in town, a lot of kids that could not get into other preschools because of health-related issues are able to get into Menominee, and it's a wonderful program. Um, it's it's worthy of a lot of support. And my biggest fear is that we in general have one school nurse here in the high school. 
these parents come in thinking uh, that you know that nurse is going to be able to service all the needs of those younger children. Some of those kids are coming in with very serious medical conditions. And I'm not talking about just the kids that are enrolled in the program. I'm also talking about the kids that come in for services. And they may come in for OT or PT or speech just for a 45-minute session or half-hour session. And the parents drop them off and <coughs> leave. So that therapist is with the student. And if something happens to that student, I, it, it, it probably takes a couple of minutes for the nurse to get down there, to drop what she's doing to get down, to get down there. And that is concerning to me. So um, in talking with them, I said, you know, the acuity of your students are, are statistically very high. So um, you really need some more support. Either we need another nurse in the high school or you need at least somebody during a good chunk of the day while those kids are down there to help meet those needs and maybe even help out a little bit in the office um, doing some paperwork for us because we have endless amounts of paperwork that we're always trying to catch up on. So I just wanted to raise that as an issue because this is something parents are expecting um, and I, I think it behooves us to uh, be cautious and make sure that no child is at risk. <coughs> Mr. Hayer. Uh, <clears throat> number one, I thank you for a great presentation. I too am very concerned about the issue of one nurse being available in this facility. Uh, I could just see a nurse on the fifth floor in this building getting called the other side of the Arlington almost to go down to monotony. I, I support that in any way we can remediate that. The other thing, uh, and I direct this either to Dr. Bodhi or you or together, do we have a way to determine if, a, if we have a sick building? I know we have a very old building, but I mean, you talk about uh, health issues and stuff and reoccurring and stuff, mm -hmm. so. Dr. Bodhi? Well. Okay. Uh, we, we, we do have, um, are you looking at it in terms of the kind of testing that we do or yeah. the... Oh, uh, no. I mean, you, you mentioned about uh, a school having oh, yeah. uh, uh, quite a few illnesses and stuff like that. I mean, as a teacher, I can remember all of a sudden, and it was determined that the, mm -hmm. the building itself had issues. Mm -hmm. uh, we had an issue a year or so ago in one school that could have promulgated health hazards with the mold and mildew. But I mean, some of these buildings, if, with the data that we capture and everything, may show we have a history. Mm -hmm. and that it is not just the sickness that we share it among ourselves, but the buildings themselves may be supporting it, and we may be able to remediate that with the building and stuff. Just like the building in Boston a few yes. years back. Yeah. Yes. Interesting question. Uh, we actually in, we had an interesting situation at the beginning of the year that I, I was uh, <coughs> called in to, to help with. Um, we uh, had a student, we have a lot of students with asthma, and uh, that particular student was in the health office constantly constantly and I even went in and I'm a nurse practitioner so I went in and I did my own physical assessment on on the child and I said you know something I don't know I'm, something isn't really right here so kept sending them the child off to um, specialists mm -hmm. asthma specialists etc and one of the concerns was maybe let's look at let's look at when she comes down what classroom she's in what part of the building she's in this was a, a, as mm -hmm. I said an artisan student and we couldn't in the end um, I, the student wasn't as bad off as we okay. thought, mm -hmm. but it was an interesting experiment because <coughs> we did look at, okay, she's in this particular section of the building or this particular room of the building during these hours. Um, I worked with Kristen Keneally on this. Um, she did a lot of the work, um, and, 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 and we were able to track, and, and there was no correlation between her symptoms or when she came down for symptoms. It te seemed to be mostly during math. So I thought maybe okay. it was the math class. It could be related, but not, <laughs> you know, not a health class. Always place. during math. Both I don't know how many kids I lose. <laughs> I Algebraitis. thought that too, but one cannot assume anything. So, <laughs> I uh, so it. So, in as far as um, specific testing, I'm not aware of anything that we do. But I do know that it, 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 there are some agencies that do. Mm -hmm. that. I realize that I'm not looking for us to go out and spend an exorbitant amount. I didn't know if. I yeah. think what you've done, we, you're looking at to see if there's anything anecdotal. Yes. At that point, if it was coming from one section of the building, then you go to Dr. Bodie and stuff and say, maybe we need to look right. at the building. Mm -hmm. No, I, that answers my question. Mr. Okay. Pierce. Thank you. <clears throat> um, is there a difference between the elementary and secondary student population? And I have a, a question right after that. In, 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 in terms of workload, in terms of what types of more typical presentations they <laughs> see? Encounters, student encounters, yeah. what they're coming to the health office for? Yeah. We can capture that data. Um, with, it, it's interesting, I'll be honest with you, um, we, 
the, the anxiety-related issues or somatic issues we see more at the middle school. Those numbers are jumping off the charts. Um, it, they've always existed at the high school. I think we're definitely seeing more, mm -hmm. but not, you know, when I looked at that data, it wasn't substantially more, to be honest with you. You know, maybe a 5% bump up. Unlike Audison, that's a huge percent bump up. Um, in the elementary schools, it's, it's, it's funny, we can capture the specifics. It's, and we can capture them by day of the week, <laughs> and we can capture them by uh, time of the year, by month. So if you look at injuries, they're higher in the warm weather in the elementary schools, that, because they're out at recess. And, um, and March is one of the toughest months that we have for some reason. The numbers might be higher because March generally doesn't have any, it doesn't have any holidays. Mm -hmm. The kids, it's a longer month. There's no vacations. So I don't know that that data is completely accurate if you, if you take into account that there's no days off. Um, but yeah, we, we, can, we can break it all down, and we have. I, I have to do a monthly report that I send into the state, and then I do, we do, we send in report, re, tons of reports to the state, to DPH. Um, I don't break down the elementary schools versus the other schools for that particular report, but we do, I do look at it on a month-to-month -month basis, and I look at the encounters every day. I'll tell you, the electronic medical records make it very easy to figure out what's going on quite often. Right. And on, on that follow-up, um, with regard to the anxiety, we've been hearing this as a school committee mm -hmm. uh, yearly. Um, not quite in the dramatic uh, disposition you put it uh, on the slide, but um, you know what, what strikes me is, is interesting is that, it, the, I mean, you said it a couple times in your talk, is you, we cannot pinpoint the reasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I would imagine that as a nurse, one takes a history, uh, you know, when did this start, uh, what is this, uh, what is this coming on as, or, or when do you feel this? Mm -hmm. And is it, is it home related, is it school related, is it a mixture of both? Um, I guess my question is really, uh, I, when are we going to figure out the root causes of the anxiety and target them? If we report by breakdown to the state, mm -hmm. you know, why can't the state note these dramatic increases and help Arlington do something about it. Why can't? Oh, this um, is across the board. Arlington's not the alone only, in this. Oh, this right. is this is everywhere. And um, but we're talking about here tonight. So right. Um, and DPH is funding studies to do this. As a matter of fact, um, the ICC grant that we have is a pilot. We, it's a pilot grant to see if we can figure out what's going on and capture it. This is a huge issue. Uh, even in Boston, there's anxiety clinics now for students. Mm -hmm. This didn't exist 10 years ago. Um, we have more and more uh, therapists moving into the area to sort of meet the needs of students because before we didn't have enough. I mean, AYCC was one of the few games in town. So um, I, I wish I could. If I could answer that, I'd make a lot of money. <laughs> I, honestly, I, I wish I could answer that. I don't know. Um, I think what's, what makes me more concerned is not just kids coming down because they're anxious or nervous or upset. I had, you know, one student came down yesterday because her friend was being mean and she had a big test coming up. That doesn't concern me. We can take care of that. What concerns me is the cutting. Mm. It's the suicidal ideation that we're seeing in young people. When I was in one of the elementary schools a few years ago, I had three students with eating disorders and two of them were kindergartners. <laughs> I've never seen that in my medical practice. I, I mean, I work in college health. Um, but it, I've never, and I see it all the time, but I, 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 I didn't even, I was speechless when I saw that. I, I really was. You know, and on medications for it, this is what we have in our schools. Mr. Thielman. So we've seen an increase in, mm -hmm. of 10,000 visits to the nursing mm -hmm. offices over the past three years. Uh, has our nurse staffing um, stayed the same over the past three years or increased? So are there more nurses to go to or fewer nurses to go to? We have, we have almost two more nurses to go to because of the uh, ESHS grant, the permanent per diem positions. So but those are, you know, they're not permanent. We call them permanent, but so they're really not permanent. Um, look, I want, I'd love to have more nurses, but I'm just asking a question. Is, is, do, you, do you think there's a correlation between the increase in the nurses and the increase in the visits? Is there? No, a, is there, I don't think there's a correlation no? at all. They're going to come no matter what. Do you um, kind of break down the numbers and look at the ones who are repeat students who just want to get out of Algebra One? Or mm -hmm. we do sometimes. As a matter of fact, I one of our unwritten policies is that if you see a student coming down more than X amount of times within a given period, I think we 
you know, basically in the fall we talked about it as a group, as a team, and we said if they come down more than 10 times in a three month period for not non-serious issues, um, you know, you see that little spot, like, <laughs> you know, I, I need a Band-Aid. It's like, I have to put my glasses on to see it and there's nothing there. So they come down maybe for somatic issues or what have you. Um, we do track that. and. What we try to do is get the parents involved. We certainly try to get either guidance or the social workers involved. So there really is a lot of collaboration in the schools. I'd like to see more collaboration between, between the guidance and between the social workers and the nurses, because it, it, it is a team approach. So we do try to, you know, sometimes we have good luck. We'll call in the parents and say, you know, just so you know, they've been down a lot of times, because we really want to get them back to class. That's the objective. You know, certainly if a, if a child is truly ill, that's, that's, that's a moot point. But we do make a concerted effort to try and dig deeper to figure out what's going on. And have you looked into, have we, have we had in this district student nurses that can help support the nurses? And is that, is that a, do you do? You, we take more student nurses now than we ever did, and that's okay. probably because I teach. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and they love to come into the public schools. There's a little bit of an issue with that. Um, there's always a liability issue with that. Um, there's the training, trying to, you know, they're only there for maybe, maybe 10 weeks at best no. um, per student because generally uh, for community health, they, they take this for community health and come into the schools. That's 60 hours of, of clinical time mm -hmm. that, for that particular course, and that's the only time you're going to see them. Um, so we've used uh, a lot of grad students, nurse practitioner grad students, as our per diem nurses. In fact, I'm I just hired, just hiring one right now. <laughs> and so does that alleviate the burden on the nurses, do you think, or? That's a good question. It's really hard to say because um, what I find is that you can get some people certain days. I mean, here's the reality. You know, we, we pay so much for a substitute nurse. And then we, I use my ESH grant to boost up the daily salary, the per diem salary, because otherwise we're not going to get them. But even then, a nurse can make three times as much, three times more working in a hospital in Boston, um, or two and a half times more working at a local hospital in our um, demographic. So where's the incentive? Sometimes we get nurses that say, that I want to go into school nursing someday, so I'm going to get my foot in the door and I'm going to become a, a, a sub. But they usually, have, they, they usually have a couple of jobs, so they're usually working in a hospital per diem, and then they're working for us per diem, so it's, it's really, it's, it's hit or miss whether we're going to get them or not. It's hard to call someone. I had three calls this morning at 6 a.m. Um, no, I'm sorry, two. One came in last night at 10. That you know, because they were sick. It, it, you know how hard it is getting a substitute nurse at 6 a.m. So I was in ASOP at 6:15 <coughs> this morning. Thank you, uh, Ms. Starks. Um, I was wondering if and when you do um, work with the social workers uh, around, especially around anxiety. How does that, what does that look like? So if someone were to show up in what, for one of our, in, with one of our nurses, mm -hmm. and, and they're realizing that the realization is that it's anxiety, right? do they ever call the social worker? Oh, absolutely. go it's in a, or absolutely. start seeing them instead? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but try to get the social workers, because they're full, their mm -hmm. schedules are so full. Sometimes we can, if it's, certainly if it's an emergent situation, they'll, right. they'll come out. And fortunately, we don't see that too often. But they're working straight through also, so right. it's 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 really hard to get their, to capture their time too. They're they're excellent. They they want to help, and they're and anytime we go to one of the social workers and say this is what I'm seeing, this is a problem, the vast majority of time they're on top of it and helping us with it. But when they're busy, we're we're the first port of call quite often. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes the student will go to guidance, or sometimes they'll go to the, gu the social worker, but if the social worker's in a meeting, quite often we're the ones that are managing the student's um, anxiety. Um, I also have a couple of budget questions. Um, I'm wondering if we bill Medicaid at all for any of these health care That's an excellent question. Um, I think we bill on, like, a handful of students, honestly, for the kids with acute medical conditions, no. And um, I was just made aware that in January that we might be able to start billing Medicaid, which would be fabulous. So I've been trying to find out how this is done. Yeah. And UMass um, runs, runs the billing, and it's been very difficult to get the information. So far, 
Um, let's take, if a child is on Mass Health, for example, and we do an oxygen saturation for cough, just check, put a little finger probe on and see what this ad is. We could bill for that. We, we can't, we're not billing for it now, and I don't know how to make that work, to be honest with you. That, I don't know how that works. Um, but from what I was told recently is that that's what we're going to be able to do. Um, we do have a decent amount of students um, on math health in our, in our town. Okay, because I know that one of the big um, pro legislative priorities um, for MASC, which is our, um, you know, organization, Mass Association of School Committees, is um, two of their big ones are retention of Medicaid covered services. So I wondered what coverage, what services there are that we can use. And also they wanted uh, more coverage for medically insured services in schools. And so uh -huh. I also <laughs> was just trying to see, I mean, it really sounds like given the, you know, extensive growth in people who are coming to see you and the, you know, seriousness of what we're seeing in our schools. Right. Um, that we should be able to somehow get some reimbursement through insurance well, um, for some of the care that we're offering. It's an excellent point, and I think that's the future. Honestly, I really do. I think that's where health care is going. Um, there was a study done by uh, the school health unit at MassDPH um, that was able to prove that for every uh, dollar that is spent on um, school nurses managing school health issues, it saves $3 in insurance. So, and uh, that was just published last spring, I think. Um, and it went nationwide. I think uh, American Academy of Pediatrics even picked it up. But it's not happening yet. Now, Cambridge, for example, has um, Cambridge Health Alliance runs a clinic at the high school with nurse practitioners. So they're billing out. Yep. So we should need to talk to them. Yeah, we, we <laughs> do need to talk to them because I have thought about it. Uh, Dr. Pangburn is our school physician. I have not approached him about this. Um, he's gone down to part-time. I don't know if he wants to take this on, but I have to be honest with you. I'd love to see that happen. And, and I do think that's the future. They, you're going to see more people like myself working in, um, working in schools. Um, there are nurse practitioners also working in a couple of uh, uh, Catholic schools, um, and one in Lawrence, and I want to say Brockton. But they're not allowed to prescribe, and we don't, they don't send out um, diagnostic tests. So all they're doing really is assessing students, you know, very intense assessments, but unfortunately they can't practice in the f within the full scope of their practice. But I'd love to see that happen someday. I have to be honest with you. I think that would be phenomenal. Right. But who would run that? You, trying to get a clinic started is um, inc it's an incredible amount of work. Uh, but if you had a hospital-based program right. that wanted to do all all of yeah. that, and you were part of that program. Yeah, should I even be suggesting this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, given our strong, uh, you know, we have obviously very strong ties to Mount Auburn here. We do in Arlington. So uh, we do. I spent many a year working there. Yeah, um, Dr. Uh, Allison Ampey. Oh, oh wait. Okay. Um, Cambridge, uh, Cambridge, and the school nurses aren't part of the school budget. They belong right. to Ca the Health Alliance in yeah. Cambridge, so they're paid in oh. a completely different way yeah, as are. their crossing guards are part of their police department. Mm -hmm. right. So they're not in the school budget at all. Right. So all that stuff, it, you know, and so they're billing through their hospital organization. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <clears throat> and there's a few towns and cities that do do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dr. Allison um, Anthony. First, I want to say thank you because this is really helpful information. I wish we had had it before <laughs> we were working on the budget, and I hope that next year we'll get an update. Um, and a little bit earlier in the budget cycle. I think the numbers are really helpful to speak to FinCom and others where we need to advocate for additional funds to populate these positions that we need. Um, I'm kind of getting back to what's already been asked, just wondering about the increased visits at the Audison, wondering what kind of data analysis you've done trying to figure out why this is happening I haven't done any data analysis to find out why this is happening. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, we do, we had uh, a care coordinator uh, was here at the high school um, doing a, an excellent job. And one of the things that, um, and she stepped down from her position. One of the things though that she said, and I have to agree with her 100%, is that um, we would get more bang for our buck at the middle school level because we're, we need to start intervening at a younger age 
if these kids are starting to get anxious in the, in the elementary schools and at the middle school level, that's the time that we need interventions. <coughs> because by the time they get to the high school, these behaviors are, are, are deep. So as to why, I, I don't know. Why are we seeing, you're asking specifically why we're seeing increase in anxiety? And no, I'm, I'm more wondering, we're seeing an increase in visits, yeah. and then is it all anxiety? You know, how, what are the different, Oh, I see what you're, okay. Um, what are the different causes? And then you, then you roll back from that, and you know, why is that? Yeah, I could probably break that down. I, I haven't, to be honest with you, but I, I could. Yeah. No, I, I just think it'd be helpful to be thinking about what's the next, you know, the next step is then why is that happening? Right, right. And, and seeing, okay. And then the other thing is just, do you know if other towns are doing electronic tra tracking as you are? Um, we all... Uh, I, all the towns around us use similar systems. Um, I don't know that anybody's breaking it down like I am. We do break it down for the state, mm -hmm. but not like this. I mean, it's I have to go in there and look at different line items, and okay. I, like I generate reports and then look. Okay. It, it takes a long time. I, <laughs> I don't would, know yeah, that anyone's breaking it down like this. I was trying to figure out how easy it would be to put together a big picture of what's going on in the state, and it sounds like it's more difficult. So thank well, you. Well, I, I think you could. I, I'll be honest with you, the, the, state, the state does capture monthly reports and then they put out a report. I, I send monthly ones and then I send a big report out at the end of the, at the, end of the um, year. And then they do publish that information. So I don't think that would be difficult to get. I think we could look at that and, and but can we, you know, we would have to, I think a better analysis would be to look at districts that are similar to ours and see if the numbers are similar. Okay. Um, because there are some districts within the grant that have to produce these, no, these reports that have half the students, and then there's Springfield, mm -hmm. and there's Boston, mm -hmm. and you know they're all part of this. Mm -hmm. that, that I and I work closely with them too, um, so I can't compare our numbers to theirs. It wouldn't. It would be very difficult. I'd rather find, you know, another town that's similar in demographics. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Seuss. Um, yes, I was wondering about um, what you think of our social and emotional programs at the Audison. So. I'm thinking specifically of the Science of Suicide program in the seventh grade and of the advisory program, uh, and, I, and, and how that interacts with, your, with the nurse's office and sort of is there communication? Yeah, that's, a, that's another really good question. It's, it's, I'm trying to think of a good analogy. Um, um, I, I think sometimes when the students have that ability to um, learn about something in advisory that that, that, that you know and talk about something that's concerning and then they know that they they're they're given the opportunity to say if you have this problem ever again you know you can speak to an adult and quite often they come to see us um, which is a privilege that, because they trust us um, so I th I think that the advisory is an excellent program to be honest with mm -hmm. you because it's you know they're working in smaller groups mm -hmm. and they're more o they're more open mm -hmm. and honest and then and then they do talk, these kids talk to each other and you know, they know where they can go. Do I know that that's conclusively um, effective? I, I couldn't say. Right. Sure. Mr. Hainer, very quickly. Re very quick, the data collecting, is that done, uh, do you send it to DESE or to the State Health Department? I send it to DPH. DPH, and is that a public uh, website that anyone can go on to, to look at the data or does do we? No, I, it's all done electronically through an Excel worksheet and then it goes off to the state, but they probably publish it. There's probably a public forum that we could and who access. And who is it again? It's a Mass Department of Public Health School Health Unit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the Warren Articles for the town meeting. Uh, Dr. Bodie. Actually, I think this is a discussion for the committee in terms of um, going looking at the warrant articles, are there any warrant articles that the committee wants to discuss among themselves and even to take a position on? We have this meeting and we also have the meeting mm -hmm. um, in later April, but town meeting starts the Monday after <coughs> the vacation. So it starts, mm -hmm. I think, on the 27th. Yeah. And our meeting will be a little bit later than that. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Uh, I assume uh, Article 19 is the revolving fund and it, it's our intent to be <coughs> creating uh, a certain amount of money in that. When will we know how much money, and I assume we're gonna vote on that to, to put that, it's gonna require a vote from us, isn't it, to establish that revolving fund? 
to establish revolving. Well, maybe I'm. Is this the is this the placeholder? Where do we put the money that we that we give to the town to hold for us the special needs emergencies? That that is a, the stabilization account, okay. and um, I think what what has happened is that since not a special town meeting, that article that warrant did not be, was not put in, but with the help of the um, finance mm -hmm. chair mm -hmm. and town manager, we have uh, another way that we're going to be able to um, take the savings that we are likely to have in our out of district. Okay, then can you project when we're gonna be ready to- Have that will, number? Will we have, have that number at, at the end of this fiscal year by June? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, th absolutely. We'll, we'll be taking a vote on that, am I correct? You'll present a number to us? To, well, we can't put it into the stabilization account at the end of the year. Then, okay, then so, let me ask, where will the money go? The money will go into um, free cash, which will be available. The town's free cash? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay, thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, oh. Mr. Thielman. So what jumped out at me is that, you know, the capital budget's gonna be before the uh, town meeting and there's gonna be Big article, a big, a big part of it's going to be the Stratton. So I assume you're going to be there and, sp and speak to it, and Diane's going to speak to it. So I don't do. I don't think we need to take any vote, do we? Or do I we? don't. I don't know if they're going to ask me to speak to it. I certainly will be there when when they take that up. This is going to come as a recommendation from the Capital Committee, mm -hmm. um, and I would think that the chair of the Capital Committee, uh, Charlie Foskett, will will speak to it. But we will be ready with any information and questions. But I think it will be there more in a there to answer questions than it will be to do the presentation. Because I, I was just, I don't know if we should take a vote saying we support it or, or should be on record. Is it, would that be helpful to you? Or is yes, it? I, I think that <clears throat> that's exactly what this is. It's okay. Like, so, if I mean, you want to have a, a, on record as a whole committee on, on different warrant yeah. articles. Yeah. So I would say, Paul, number 24. Um, go ahead. Uh, oh, then, okay. So I, I, I move that the school committee uh, is is placed on record as is in favor of Article 24 of the capital budget, uh, and specifically the uh, renovation of the Stratton, the Stratton School. School. And I'll second school. that for the purposes of discussion. Mm. And the electronics. Uh, seconded by Mr. Hainer. Mr. Hainer is has the floor. And the I, 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 we are, in this capital budget is also the athletic field. Am I right. correct? Yes. Okay. And do we have anything else in the, the capital budget besides <laughs> that? So let's get all hands over Technology. Here. Okay. Yeah. So I think if we're on, but if we're on record is in favor of the whole capital budget, then we got everything. Yeah. Specifically anything Fine. related to the schools. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well. So we, yeah, we're, yeah, it's, yeah, that's, so I, that's the motion. I second that. You got that, that Karen? I mean, okay, the motion is to no. support the capital budget under Article Article uh, 24. 24. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, unanimous vote. Mr. Hainer. Article 28 is the Minuteman budget. I don't know whether we want to get involved in that or not. Uh, it's okay, thank you. No, and, and if you note, there's no uh, further appropriations, capital stuff or uh, regional agreement on the warrant right now for them. So uh, uh, they're, they're, they don't seem to be making any progress over there. Um, anything else under the warrant articles? Hearing none, month, monthly financial reports. Uh, Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Um, there isn't a big change to report um, for this month. We are, um, our deadline for submissions is April 17th. So I hope by the first report in May, I'll have a better sense of where we'll come out um, and I'll be able to project savings. Right now, I'm still not projecting savings in line where I do, where I do expect to see savings. Um, so we'll have a better sense. Um, we still have sufficient reserves to cover the deficit as I'm reporting it, but I do expect that to shrink, even with the amount of money that we plan to leave um, as you know savings balance at the end of the day to go into free cash to hopefully, well, the, the plan as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I think the Finance Committee is gonna discuss this next okay. week. Okay, right. so we'll let, that, we'll let that slide. But the plan is that we're gonna get it into some kind of reserve. It's just gonna take an extra year. Mm -hmm. Questions, comments? Dr. Seuss? Oh, oh, just a question about this free cash. I know that uh, the town budget usually takes half of the free cash amount. Mm -hmm. 
Um, they wouldn't take half of this amount, I assume. It would just be, okay. So we're trying to find a mechanism. <laughs> we're trying to find a mechanism to be able to put it into a stabilization account a year from now, assuming that the money's not needed next year for um, current costs at that time. But it sort of then becomes a gentleman, gentlewoman's agreement mm -hmm. of some sort. Okay. But we're all in agreement on how to do it. Okay. Superintendent's report. I don't have um, a lot this evening, um, but I do want to. Uh, it let you know um, that yesterday we held a, um, a coffee for applicants of color to come and meet department chairs, principals, um, to talk about their interests and and uh, hear more about the Arlington Public Schools. And I want to thank uh, Rob Spiegel for organizing this and and also my superintendent's advisory committee um, for diversity. They were very instrumental and, and showed up yesterday and I want to thank Mr. Hainer for coming and representing the school committee. We had I think more candidates this year than we've had in past years which was which was terrific and part of that is just getting the word out um, when Rob goes to a, 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 ma a fair a job fair he also has all of the brochures about it so it was it was very good and we had a number of candidates who actually had the certifications of positions that we're, we're going to need to, to fill. So hopefully we will have at least one of these candidates become Arlington employees next year. Um, this, this last Monday, we had um, Michelle Gay and Scott Sensenbaugh, who was the lieutenant in um, Wilmington, come and do a presentation an overview of Alice protocol. And this was um, organized by Cindy uh, Sheridan Curran, who is our who is the person who oversees a lot of our work around practices for uh, lockdowns and and shelter in place, and also Steve Porcello, who is our school resource officer. They have been working very closely with me as we begin the process of doing the. Um, the education, the training that's going to be necessary as we introduce this protocol into the Arlington Public Schools. So I want to thank them, and I think we had about 100 people attend on, on Monday night, which was terrific. We, I also had a meeting last week with um, Stratton uh, parents around the relocation, and I, and I acknowledge that there is a lot of work that has to be done. The important thing is getting the the big pieces in place, and I've talked a little bit about that at the last meeting in terms of the research that went into the decision about where we would locate uh, the portable classrooms. I, I do want to correct one misconception, though, that that uh, parents brought up tonight, and that is the cost of a, of a modular. Um, we're hoping by having a number of modules, we're going to bring the cost down. But if you were to simply go and get a modular classroom, it's more like $250,000. But our total modular um, installations will probably be in the neighborhood of about $1.5 million. Would you say that's uh, about accurate in terms of the, the, the total cost for modular classrooms for next year, assuming that we have or it will be more than that? It'll be more than that. Be more I think than it's that. closer, I think it's just around $2 million. $2 million, okay. So it's a substantial amount of money that is going to be expended on this. And there's the, cla the classrooms will be, um, the, the classrooms that we put at Audison will be of a different grade of classrooms and a much more expensive classroom. So it's a, modular classrooms are expensive. Mm -hmm. And, um, so we didn't take this very lightly because if we could have students in our buildings, we would because it is expensive. And the Capital Committee, as part of the Stratton budget for next year, has included another additional $2 million just simply for relocation. Mm -hmm. And I wish we didn't have to have that amount of money spent, but that's the, that's the situation we have in the district right now. So there will be more. There's some. We're, we at that meeting we took copious notes. There's a lot of things we need to address. We're, there's going to be um, future meetings um, with Stratton parents and staff members to talk more about this and get their input so that we have when we go when we actually do the relocation we're going to have a very smooth mm -hmm. transition and a very successful year. That's what we all want. 
And um, lastly, the Board of Selectmen, as you know, supported the submission of the uh, statement of interest for the high school. And we have uh, the, um, uh, all the documents ready to go. And part, the last part of it is tonight when you vote on the minutes, because then the new chair will sign those minutes and off it goes to the MSBA. That's it. Excellent. Uh, next item, Day on the Hill. Um, we're going to be going off to Day on the Hill uh, for MASC on April 29th. Uh, I think uh, a majority of us will be attending. Um, uh, but I wanted to reserve a little bit of time here to discuss what we might want to say. Uh, the one thing I would say is that experience has it that when we visit uh, our senator, um, Mr. Donnelly, uh, he's very appreciative if we have a targeted list of things for him to do and also uh, possibly pointing him towards bills that we're interested in. So I would encourage us to do some research between now and the time we go uh, to meet up with him in order to have uh, a list of, uh, of items that, that he can take action on. Ms. Starks. Um, so I have been in contact with uh, Representatives Garbley, uh, Rogers, and um, today I heard back from Senator Donnelly's office. Uh, they are offering Senators Donnelly's office and Senator Donnelly mm -hmm. um, for a meeting at 1130 with mm -hmm. us. Um, and he graciously also um, invited uh, the representatives, uh, Rogers and Garbley. Mm -hmm. And um, so I responded, yes, please uh, put us in there. Well, we would be um, a fairly large group um, as they probably expected. Um, my response to them, and I can forward it on to everybody, but here is the list of things that I told, I asked him if there was anything that they would like to hear from us. Like, is there stuff that they need backing on that, you know, our, our senators and, re and our representatives, I think, are very good about supporting a lot of the things that we support. But sometimes it might help if they have numbers or if they have information. So I said, is there anything that you wanted? Mm -hmm. Um, in addition, I said that I wanted to talk about this list of things. Um, unfunded mandates mm -hmm. and getting their help on figuring out how to stop them, fund these, or somehow better deal with these. Um, two, what they think about the kindergarten fee, and I want to share what that means personally to us and how we're going to deal with it if, in fact, the kindergarten um, grant goes away. Um, I also wanted to talk to them about our take on the foundation budget. Um, Kiersey wrote that amazing letter, and I really want her to be able to have some time to talk to them about that. Um, I want to talk to them about the stuff from the nursing, um, specifically about how and what we can bill Medicaid for, how we can get information on that, um, and that we need their backing and their help to make sure that we can do more of that, because obviously we need the money for that. Um, special education. Mm -hmm. um, I really want them to understand how fully funding the circuit breaker may be a part of the foundation budget. I mean, I, I don't know how that is possible, but like, if the, if they could just fund special education better, I feel like we would have so much more money in our budget because we maybe we wouldn't have to use all the money for special education. And um, I just really want to talk to them about that. Um, technology, like, there's no money from the state for technology yet we all have to do that um, and getting a teacher on the board of education so that was the list of things that i knew that we had all been interested in um, i know that there are probably other things so if people want to add to that i'm happy to you know kind of be the liaison um, to kind of setting up an agenda with these people um, and i also think that the best thing we can do is try to have Someone who's a point person doesn't mean that no one else can talk on that, but mm -hmm. if we have a point person for mm -hmm. each topic, mm -hmm. it really helps if someone's gathering the information mm -hmm. for that topic. And then also it means that we don't all have to look into all of these things and be the, mm -hmm. be the point person. The Board of Ed uh, mm -hmm. issue has been a sore point for me for many, many years. Uh, and you're my prime example, <laughs> is that uh, once upon a time you were qualified to be a member of the State Board of Education, then you got elected to the school committee and you were disqualified by law. And then you took a teaching job which gave you a double disqualification. <laughs> Every other profession in this, uh, and, and trade, has a governing board that is at least 50% made up of people who hold the license and are actually active practitioners. 
And one of the places of disagreement in terms of legislation in the past has been that <coughs> between MASC and, 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 and the teachers is that the teachers want a teacher on the board, MASC wants the prohibition lifted. <laughs> so that what we really need is legislation to get everybody on board that not only uh, requires there to be some licensed educators on the board, but also to remove the prohibition of people who have knowledge of the profession from actually serving. Because this is our licensure board. This, this board gives out our licenses. And I think that it's sort of criminal that we're the only profession where we don't have a say in our own licensure. Uh, uh, the, uh, who else would like to speak on this? Uh, Dr. Pody. Actually, I just want to bring up a point about Medicaid. Mm -hmm. You are aware that we, we do bill for mm -hmm. for students um, that have um, IEPs. Mm -hmm. But the mechanism we have in this town is that money goes into the general fund. Mm -hmm. And it goes through the formula that we have. Mm -hmm. The other issue with Circuit Breaker, if it becomes part of the foundation budget, mm -hmm. it will go the same direction. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I, so I think that that's something we have to be conscious of. Yeah, the question is, the, the, the circuit breaker, the regional transportation, there are going to be a lot of people talking about that. Um, they are subject to appropriation, so that if there's a formula that gets you, in an ideal world, $5 million, and they only appropriate enough to go around for three and a half, that's what you get. Right. Um, regardless of what the underlying intent is. So uh, that that's a recurring problem. Um, mm -hmm. 9C cuts uh, and the impact of that, oh, uh, that's a good the, the too, folding yeah. in of uh, the other grants into, uh, into a block grant and the reduction of the money. And the uh, foundation budget is certainly a critical issue because uh, the underlying impact of the foundation budget is that it's supposed to rise as the cost of providing an education rises and the state is supposed to fill in the gap between what a municipality can afford and what the cost of an adequate education is. And by underinflating the cost of an adequate education, all they've ended up doing is reducing the amount that the state has to kick in to make up the gap between the town's ability to pay and the actual cost of an education, which is why we've imposed fees and had to go for overrides and done all the stuff that we have to do. And, and, and Chapter 70 reform is really a critical issue for us. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Seuss. Um, I just want to point out the, the timing of the kindergarten grant cut is particularly mm -hmm. devastating mm -hmm. to us because we've already made our budget decisions. Mm -hmm. um, that's almost a quarter of a million cut. Um, and, you know, sort of if, mm -hmm. if the cut is the right way to go be, and money gets shifted around, um, just having more notice, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it be gradual mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. would be potentially something to push for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mr. Hainer. Uh, I think that brings to the point that at some time in the near future, we need to look at all our grants and how dependent we are on grants mm -hmm. and to start weaning ourselves away from, the, be able to take advantage of the grant money for just the purposes of grants. And I'm not saying it's going to happen overnight, but I think we and a lot of other communities have become, because of economics, and stuff, very dependent on grants, and we can't. It's just a fact. We, we need to take a hard look at this and start working ourselves off it. Thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Okay, a couple things. Um, first, to add to your list, we need to have the Chapter 70 formula put on because mm -hmm. that continues to have problems and under, I think does not represent Arlington fairly in terms of how much mm -hmm. we can pay. Um, and mm -hmm. so we get less Chapter 70 aid than we really should, even for the Mm -hmm. foundation budget as it stands. Um, to speak to the circuit breaker, it's fine to ask for fully funding the circuit breaker, but we're talking, when I looked at the past mm -hmm. 2011 to 2013, we had mm -hmm. 607,000, $6.7 million in out of district tuitions mm -hmm. that were eligible for, or, mm -hmm. or that were total of that we only got 1.5 back mm -hmm. of circuit breaker. So mm -hmm. if we have 25%, you know, if, if we go fully funded, mm -hmm. we're only talking maybe 25% onto that um, 1.5 million, so another 0 0.5 million. We need to be going after the 4 million that they're not including mm -hmm. in foundation budget. 
mm -hmm. between what we spent and what the foundation budget was, mm -hmm. there was a $5.2 million gap. Mm -hmm. That's the bit we need to cover. I mean, you know, the circuit breaker's taken a little edge off the top, mm -hmm. but, but there's a huge amount of money that's not being mm -hmm. covered at all. And that's, we need the foundation budget to better represent mm -hmm. what our actual needs and spending is and what the needs of our children is. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Thank you. Uh, consent agenda. I'm going to ask to pull the minutes of March 26th from the consent agenda. Uh, under the policy, <coughs> all items so uh, be voted in one motion. Uh, approval of warrant 15130, dated uh, March 26th, for the amount of $411,130.28. Approval of job descriptions, teachers blind and visually impaired. Uh, orientation and mobility and speech language pathology. Uh, assistant, approval of the second reading of the superintendent's goals, vote to approve the four goals for the survey of Superintendent Bodie, practice goal 2014-15, student achievement goal 2014-2015, school committee superintendent's goal 3.4 and 4.3. Motion by Mr. Thielman, seconded by uh, Mr. Pierce, <coughs> any discussion? No, of course not. It's, a, uh, it's the consent agenda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Now, approval of the minutes, regular meeting of March 26, 2015, moved so by moved. Dr. Allison Ampey, seconded by Mr. Second. Thielman. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And I abstain, having been absent from that meeting. Um, subcommittee and liaison reports and announcements? Um, I'm just trying to get the list of who's the, uh, I'll just go around the room. Uh, Mr. Hainer. The, uh, the superintendent's uh, evaluation part, uh, I would ask the group to uh, approve a second reading. Uh, we just pat did the goals uh, on the uh, survey mm -hmm. that would be presented. Uh, I received some questions. Uh, by uh, Dr. Seuss. I don't know if we're going to have any discussion on that. Uh, if you want to, you know, all, um, okay. Oh, oh well, I, <laughs> do you want me to? Um, so one of my sort of bigger concerns, is, it's a small concern though, <laughs> is um, that several places. Just a question. Mm -hmm. Didn't we do just to prove this in the consent agenda? Yeah, yeah okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, we did. Should so I? we don't have anything before. No, we right? didn't. We did not approve the survey. Oh, you did oh, not no, approve the survey. Oh, the survey's okay, not in the survey. Okay, yeah, the survey's not survey. in here. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right, thanks for the clarification. Um, no, I just had a small, small point. Um, there were a couple places where all was included, and it felt like it made it a much broader question that, that maybe an educator would feel uncomfortable answering that the superintendent um, is able to advance every single person's professional development, for example, you know, that, that a sort of a weaker question might be more accurate. You might just get better responses. And that was sort of my one. Mr. Hainer. Question. If I may, through the chair, is your concern of them being able to do it or being willing to do it? As far as willing, this survey, I've talked to Mr. Good, will be totally anonymous. Oh, oh no, I, if I were looking at that question, I'd say, I can't answer this accurately. Then, well, then there's also that option of not applicable to them. Uh, maybe, I don't, I don't know how the board feels about it, a comment uh, spot down at the bottom where they could, but my only concern about that is this is such a lengthy survey, some people may want to con comment on, on, on every single question. I, do, I don't know. Would it, would it help it if it said like, um, for all you know, or, I mean, I think that the intent of it was obviously in your realm right, of what right. you deal with. It doesn't mean, you know, all is, it's only all in your world in your dealings with the superintendent. Is that the thing that needs I to be clarified? I think if you took out the word all, you would get an accurate response. It would get you what you're looking for okay. without causing somebody to pause. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That sort of was my feeling. Okay. You'd still get the answer you're looking for, but but they all would, might sort of give someone a pause and say, oh, I'm not sure I can answer that. I know about 80%, but not the other ones. Okay. Okay. Mr. Pierce. Uh, policies and procedures will be meeting on Tuesday evening. Um, we'll be discussing uh, the policies on student conduct and discipline, as well as um, 
uh, new revisions to um, Family Medical Leave Act policy and uh, parental, parental, leave. parental leave. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Allison Ampey. Budget will be meeting on um, Wednesday at 5, and we'll be discussing the report to town meeting. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ms. Starks. Uh, facilities will be calling a meeting in the next couple of weeks to further the conversations that started um, a couple weeks ago, and uh, I will send out a doodle for that. Mr. Thielman. No report right now. Uh, and Dr. Seuss. Uh, no, I guess I'm just newly chair of a committee, so I'll send out something soon. Okay. And uh, Mr. The contract Hainer. Com uh, committee, uh, warrant committee, excuse me, same as Dr. Seuss was mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we have concluded the public por portion of our meeting. I, well, Mr. Hainer. Uh, I would ask the uh, body for a uh, matter of personal privilege. I just want to read a sh very short statement, if I may. Go ahead, sir. I wish to state for the record that my recent resignation from all negotiation subcommittees was not, and I repeat, not caused by any disagreement with any member of this school committee. I wish to publicly state that their diligence and work ethic has and continues to be an inspiration to me. Thank you. Well, Thank mostly, you. mostly mine, right? Yes, it's all you, Jed. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, do we have to approve your signing of the minutes? Uh, no, we uh, approved the minutes. I know we approved the minutes, but do we have to approve him, authorize you to sign them no, or something? He's the chair. We approved the SOI last mm -hmm. meeting. Okay. So they just need approval of the minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's just. I'm verifying that oh, that's oh, a true oh. voted okay. set of okay. minutes. That's all I'm doing. Oh, excellent. Making sure you're authorized to do what you're supposed to do. Um, thank you. Anything else before uh, we'll entertain a motion to go into executive session? So for moved. which we will only return for the purpose of adjourning for the purposes of conducting strategy sessions in prep preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect and to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chair so declares. Motion by Mr. Pierce, seconded by? Second. Uh, Ms. Starks, roll call. Mr. Uh, Hayner? Aye. aye. Mr. Pierce, Dr. Allison aye. Ampey, Ms. Starks, Mr. Thielman? Aye. Dr. Aye. Seuss, Mr. Schlickman votes aye, and uh, we are now in an executive session.